Good afternoon. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Apologies in advance for my accent. Um, some people, especially Emil over there, have pointed out they have no idea what I'm saying. So I'm sorry, there's not much I can do about it. But please interrupt at any point um, with any questions at all. I love heckling, I love people trying to steer the conversation in an interesting direction. Perfect, brilliant. Well, if Emil can understand me um, preemptively apologizing, then we're all fine. Um, I should also apologize because last year I was meant to be here um, talking about Matrix and at the last minute had to pull out. And I think I did it remotely. I dread to think how well that went. Um, but this is trying to make up for that and hopefully tell everybody in the free switch ecosystem all about Matrix. So first of all, how many people know what Matrix is already? So I can try to gauge this. Got about 10 people, 12 people. So OK. Um, I guess I'll try to give some context on what we are. So we're kind of unusual in that we are a nonprofit, open standard, and our mission is to defragment communication. So this is all about fixing the different wall gardens and silos that exist today, whether it's between, I don't know, WhatsApp and Skype, or it could be between SIP and XMPP, or any of these other different um, sort of ecosystems that exist. The idea of Matrix is to provide a meta network which goes and links them all together. From a techie perspective, you can think of this um, as being a decentralized and open, persistent, eventually consistent, cryptographically secure messaging database, which happens to have a JSON over HTTP API. Sorry that that's completely indigestible, but it's kind of uh, uh, the simplest way to describe the underlying technologies here. So it's open in that it's both open source, it's an open standard, it's an open federated network. It's decentralized because there is no single point of control. All of your conversations in Matrix is spread over everybody who participates in that conversation. It's all about storing conversation history. So in Matrix, conversation history is your kind of first class building block. This history is synchronized with eventual consistency over all the servers which participate in a conversation. Obviously, you can use it as a messaging database, but you can store any kind of JSON you like in it. And you're probably thinking, why? Well, the, the goal, as I said, is to create this global communications meta network which bridges all of the existing silos and basically liberates our communication to be owned and controlled by us. So rather than being dependent on Facebook or Google or Apple or whoever it might happen to be, uh, or even the telcos or the PSTN, instead, in a matrix world, anybody can spin up their server and own a copy of their communication. And it's not just um, terminating and originating messages or calls. It's actually having a cryptographically signed copy of all of your communication that you can select in terms of the vendor or the service provider who you use, or you run your own matrix server. So graphically speaking, it ends up looking like this with um, a whole bunch of silos around the edge, whether that's the PSTN silo, something like Skype or Hangouts. It could be an application ecosystem like GitHub, and you, know, you can keep on running your own bridges, your own um, integrations into these things anywhere in the wider matrix network. And then you have a mesh of matrix servers with clients hanging off them um, like so within. As I said, the whole idea is that no party own your conversations. So if I'm running the matrix.org server and I'm talking to a conversation on the free switch server um, and someone else is participating from, say, a free node bridge onto IRC, then the conversation, it's a bit like Git, really. Just like Git is a decentralized version control system and everybody goes and pushes and pulls between their repositories, it's just the same in matrix. Everybody has a full clone of the conversation, and they're pushing and pulling the information between each other in real time. So what can you do with it? Well, the obvious thing is obviously group chat, like IRC or Slack or whatever. One-to-one -one conversations in Matrix is a subset of group chat. It's a room that has two people in it. A big use case that we love is WebRTC signaling. So Matrix is an HTTP API. It's an open standardized API. To go and set up a call is basically two HTTP hits, one to send an offer, another to get an answer, and then you're in. So no more SIP, no more um, telco-style protocols. It's just a very simple HTTP interface, much like the Virto protocol that FreeSwitch has 
with the difference being that the matrix um, one is just out there as a de facto open standard for anybody who wants to integrate it on any server or service. Um, you can use it for bridging any kind of silos, obviously. Um, IoT data is a kind of fun one because something that the IoT is screaming out for is a data fabric where anybody can go and publish information and subscribe to information. My, my Fitbit or my Garmin or my Apple Watch or whatever should just be able to publish some data and then somewhere else, somewhere on the internet, somebody should be able to subscribe to that data and analyze it, visualize it, whatever you might want to happen. Instead, at the moment, it's all trapped inside the wall gardens, the Apple wall garden, the Garmin wall garden. And so Matrix, again, is trying to bust these silos open and provide a very pragmatic meta network to link them. Architecturally, um, you end up with a bunch of servers, much like email or XMPP servers, or for that matter, SIP servers, and you have um, clients which hang off these, and then you have application services which act as bridges and value-added functionality to the network. And this is the really interesting thing where you go and run your bridge to, through to SIP or the PSTN or whatever, and you also have identity servers which go and map from other third-party identity providers like email or E164 through to Matrix's internal identifiers. I mean, if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, it's just another mesh, the interesting thing, as I keep saying, is that the actual data is replicated over all of these which participate in the same room. So it's not like email or XMPP or SIP where um, each node is kind of, uh, it's not even necessarily a store and forward system. Instead, it's more a database node which anybody can participate in. Now, the actual ecosystem that we have today looks like this. Um, the core of it is the big blue matrix spec at the bottom, which defines the HTTP APIs for sending and receiving um, history, synchronizing history, effectively. Below that, you have the server side. You have Synapse, which is our Python and Twisted reference implementation of the matrix server, home server. Then you have a whole bunch of application services and bridges that we provide through matrix itself. And the orange stuff are third-party um, community um, contributions. And so there are about six other servers um, for Matrix out there, of which one, Rumor, is looking really good in Rust um, today. Lots of different bridges and bots and things. On the client side, we provide three different SDK stacks for JavaScript, for iOS and Android. These are split into the layer that does the HTTP um, wrapping here. And then you have a user interface layer that gives you things like WebRTC calls and chat rooms and contact lists and all of the kind of building blocks for a real app. And then we have some completely unusable, ugly console apps, which are the reference examples of just gluing these components together. But more recently, we've been seeing some really sexy, fully functional third-party clients. And this is the Vexor logo here. And Vexor is our flagship client for the Matrix ecosystem that are built, is built on the same SDKs, but we're really trying to get it up to a Slack or um, a WhatsApp level of user experience and user interface. Quickly, what do we actually get in the spec? Well, the main building block is decentralized conversation history. That comes in the form of a timeline of messages, but you also get key value to store whatever metadata you like on a room. Obviously, group messaging, VoIP signaling for WebRTC. More interestingly, synchronized push notification rules on the server, so that if you set up your notifications on one client, it then operates over all of your clients, which is kind of fun. Um, Server-side full-text search, read receipts, typing notifications, presence, synchronized unread counts, which is a surprisingly large pain in the ass to get right so that the badge count on all of your different apps is completely in sync and with all of your push notification stuff. Um, you get a content repository, a distributed file system for free. Um, you have the ability to store arbitrary account data for users, both per user and per room, and most excitingly, end-to-end -end encryption provided as a core part of the spec. Now, the end-to-end -end work has been going on for ages now, over a year. It is very, very nearly in place. In fact, we're betering it right now on the develop branch of Vector, and this is really exciting because it's fundamentally encrypting end-to-end -end everything that is going over this mesh of network uh, of servers. So it's not an application level afterthought. It's um, actually baked into the core of the protocol. 
Some people, or about 12 of you, are wondering, hang on, I've heard this all before last year, what's new since then? Well, a quick update for what's happened since August of last year. Most of our work has been on Vector, making sure there's a Keller app for the Matrix ecosystem. Things like read receipts, unread counts, email notifs, URL previews, guest access, third party invites, and room tagging are all new in the last year. Mentioned end to end encryption. More exciting has been the community. So lots more clients, um, native clients in Qt, like native chat, Quaternion. PTO is really cool. It turns all of Matrix into a great big decentralized IRC network. So it's a, effectively a client for Matrix that exposes it as an IRC server running on port 6667 so that you can fire up your XChat or whatever you like, Merck perhaps, and go and connect to Matrix as if it was IRC. We've got SDKs from the community for Qt and Glib, the rumor um, home server implementation in Rust, lots of contributions for different login APIs, LDAP, Java web, um, JavaScript web tokens, CAS, SAML, and then an awful lot of work making Synapse, which is the reference Python and Twisted server, not suck. So specifically, horizontal scalability, the ability to separate it into different microservices and then scale these up um, according to demand. And that's been very important for the matrix.org server, which everybody hits by default and is now up to about 300,000 accounts and many thousands of um, concurrent active users. So it's been really fun to get the scalability of Synapse um, to support that. So let, let, let's, I'll stop talking and actually show some demos of where things are at right now and also what the relevance is to free switch, heaven forbid. So here is um, Vexa. Can people see that okay on the web? Is that legible at all? Yeah? Cool. Okay, so here's Vexa, which is um, sitting here on the, on the web, obviously. And it looks kind of like a Slack style interface. I've, I've actually got about um, oh yeah, 500 um, rooms open here and different conversations going on around the place. So it actually scales quite a lot better than um, some other tools. Go to say Matrix HQ, which is the main one you saw. A green line disappear there. That was my read markers showing me where I'd read up to. Um, this room's got 4,000 people in it right now, of which probably a good couple of hundreds are online. Um, lots of random people going and chatting about the protocol. Um, we've got read receipts on the right-hand side. So if I go and say, uh, hi, everyone, then hopefully we'll see a couple of read receipts and go bubbling down the right-hand side. Come on, somebody read it. Come on, you know you want to. Yay, there we go. <laughs> so there's um, uh, one of my colleagues going and um, helpfully going and reading what's going on. You've got your typing notifications coming back. You can see, interestingly, uh, well, when he was typing, <laughs> oh, there we go, that um, he's got a username, and these are internal matrix IDs, which are user at username colon domain. He's using his personal server at sw1v.org. I'm at Matthew on matrix.org. And yeah, you can basically see that this conversation here is actually being replicated over about 500 different servers. So of the 4,000 people in this room, uh, we've got about 500 different instances. So every time somebody sends a message, it's being pushed out over the federation. Uh, what else can I show you? Let's go and um, chuck an image in here. Uh, hopefully nothing too embarrassing. Oh, upload it. Yes, I do want to upload that. Oh, hi there, Crone. Um, it's quite cold in here, let's face it. The air conditioning was quite cold <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> so if people are ready for winter, then at least some John Snow is, and you get obviously rollover animated GIFs, all that sort of good stuff. More interesting is if we actually look at the source of any of this, you can see underlying it's just a bunch of JSON. And you can put any type of data you like into the content. It could, so here it's got the metadata and the MIME type and the size of the image. It's got a uh, old text and a bunch of metadata who sent it. It's a matrix.room.message type and a transaction ID and it's in this room. But if we compare that with, oh, we're zoomed in now, um, the guest 3390, um, then much more simple message, just saying body hola, message type, m.text. But the cool thing is that you can put anything you like in here. It could be VoIP signaling, it could be IoT data, um, it could be an email, really anything you damn well like. Um, ooh, that's an interesting layout bucket. <laughs> 
Okay, pretend you didn't see that. No, oh, there we go, that's better. Um, what else can I show you? Let me show you the iOS client, which is completely new um, since last year. And I'm hoping that, in fact, Vector as a whole is completely new, I think, since last year. If I go and airplay my phone onto my Mac and pray, and I hope that nobody sends me anything too embarrassing. Oh, you can see a push notification coming in there already from HQ of um, somebody saying, hi, Matthew. I'm going to scroll down. There's a message there. I've got my 10 messages here on Vector. And so I'll go and launch it here on iOS. <laughs> what am I ready for? Thank you, winter is coming. I've just watched a lot of Game of Thrones, apologies. <laughs> so this is taking longer to sync than it should. And let's wait a minute for that to, oh, in fact, so this is a dev build which is going to be running slow because what I want to show off is the free switch based video conferencing that we had just written last um, ClueCon. Um, but now it's actually, we've just gone and added it in the last week onto both the iOS and Android um, clients here. Ooh, come on, come back. Uh, sorry, there we go. So well, I've got all the same rooms here. I can quickly scroll through on iOS. We've got how many hundred rooms flying around. If we go to HQ, then we can see the same conversation. And so well, it hasn't quite loaded yet. We can go and click through on the GIF. And there's Jon Snow being ready. And yeah, winter. You can see a lot more read receipts flying around here. But let's do something a bit more exciting. In fact, it would be risky and try to do a video conference in this room with 4,000 people and see who's crazy enough to join. I think that sounds like a stu suitably stupid thing to try to do. Um, so let's go and hit the video call button. It's still in beta, so you get a warning coming up here. This is talking through to a free switch now. And hopefully, hopefully, why am I trying to do a live demo? <laughs> that was a good start. OK, let me try it. Let me take it off the VPN in case I've got weird ice problems going on. Let's Let's do it in the room where I tested this earlier, and it did work, rather than trying to change my scripts on the fly and suffering the consequences. So I'm going to test it with um, Matthew, Evil Matthew, and other Matthew, who are various alternate egos of myself. And I'm already in a call. Well, that's great. Let me, s mm, let me go and refresh that, which unfortunately is going to take a while. Well, since refreshing, I'll go and share the screen here again. OK, so meanwhile, back here, well, we've got an on ongoing conference call that knows about it there, even though something went wrong on the web browser. Let me go and find the same room here. So I'm going to go and filter it through to Evil Matthew. And um, here's a conference. I'm going to test this. And yeah, there we go. So th this is looking a bit better. Now, hopefully, if I go and place the call in there, this time it might actually work. Crossing fingers. If not, we might get to do some live debugging to find out what happened to the free switch, which this is meant to be running off. Um, just bear with me one second whilst we go and uh, log in as root onto this box where the free switch is running. So honestly, it's been quite interesting getting um, the free switch um, conferencing to work, especially with Chrome 52, which went and broke all of the DTLS um, stuff. And actually, interestingly, this is running in a cheroot. Um, and well, the, serv the service is still there, which is promising. And that's looking relatively OK. It might be the application service which is failing on this. So well, what's actually happening is that we're running a matrix application service called um, Virto AS. Um, let me go and see what's happening in its log. And you can see the JSON of the events which are being pushed um, back and forth here. Oh, and that's all looking fairly promising with a couple of 403s going on there. I'm just going to restart it. Um, and it's running as a node thing using uh, forever. So you can see a, a forever restart going through there. On the free switch end, you can see that the WebSocket connection on Virto is um, being closed and it's reopened up. Now, let's hope that this will actually work. 
Uh, so that's gone and got itself in some co confused state because it thought it was in a conference already. But let me try anyway. So meanwhile, you really hope that that mess uh, that we'll see a call going into free switch right now. Okay, that's looking promising. So it gets as far as a handshake to set up, set up to ready. And for whatever mystical reason, despite this working perfectly when I tried it, we're getting media timeout, ice errors, and no audio stem for a long time. How annoying. I guess I'm running out of time, so I probably shouldn't spend it much longer debugging this. I'll just come off the VPN one last time and hope. Yeah, I'm on the right Wi-Fi. This, uh, this worked really well when I tested it. If anybody was in here over lunch and I tested, it was... Yeah. Yeah, I'm on no, no, it's not your fault at all. <laughs> For whatever reason, ice is just crapping out. <laughs> anyway, okay, well, it, suffice it to say that what's meant to be happening there um, is if we go and look at the APIs under the hood, we've got the client server API, so it's just sending a message, it's a single HTTP push, uh, post with the JSON of the message, and you get back an event ID. For something more exciting, like um, a WebRTC call, you send out the offer with the SDP, and you get back an event ID, and then you get the uh, SDP answer. Um, so what was going on there is trying to do an invite, send some candidates, then you should get an answer and a hang up. In practice, we know we're never getting the answer because the candidates and the ice that we were sending through, for whatever reason, wasn't working. Um, so the actual architecture is that you have a bridge which talks to something like FreeSwitch with some clients hanging off it. And what I was debugging in Node there is Matrix JavaScript SDK with Node SDK on top, which then has a bridging library on top. And then you have bridges through to IRC or Slack or anything libpurple can talk. Um, and so you know, IRC network, IRC clients, bridge into Matrix. Similarly for Slack, similarly for SMS. It can do anything with libpurple, and then perhaps an interest, a more interesting demo might be if I took Skype, for instance, and just said, uh, well, will this demo work? And hopefully, meanwhile, um, really, are all my demos going to fail today? <laughs> it's going to be amazing. On the Skype demo here. Oh, well, there we go. So at least we've got the Skype AS working. Yay. And there we go. So you've got messages going back and forth between Skype, which gives an idea. You could also go to somewhere like Slack on the matrix.org one and see the same information being bridged here into Slack. So on matri hash matrix itself. Uh, we've got, oh, there's John Snow again, <laughs> and the conversation from earlier also happening in Matrix, and likewise on IRC, I could go to hash Matrix here, which nobody can see, but suffice it to say, at the bottom, you've got so the same conversation, complete with a link through, whoops, a link through there, which will go and bring up him again. So, I mean, it's the same conversation um, being relayed around the place. Uh, now, what we should have seen on the free switch um, demo, complete with randomly broken slide, everything's going wrong, is a um, yeah, Virto bridge that w seemed to be working, talking Virto for it to, through to the free switch, which seemed to be working. And the kind of flow is to do the invites. Uh, well, you log into free switch via Virto, you do invites and candidates, answers, and then the media should flow, assuming that the ice has succeeded. Um, I'm running out of time, big time, I assume. Got four minutes. Um, we started out in September of 2014, Late beta, about 300,000 accounts on matrix.org, although many of them are bridged through to IRC and Slack. Um, we are pushing about 300,000 messages a day on that server. A fun thing is the number of rooms that matrix.org participates in. If we go and filter out the bridged rooms over the last two years, you can see the actual number of active rooms on the server is going up in this comedy um, shape, which hopefully is a sign of good things to come. What do we have in the future? Well, end-to-end -end is going to be a huge thing. Um, hosting bridges and bots for folks. Threading is a huge, huge, huge deal that we're putting a lot of time into at the moment. The ability to do reactions and likes and voting. 
ACLs, file tagging and management, decentralized identity, and most importantly, fixing spam, which is a huge deal in Matrix, because if we don't get it right, we've just created the most um, spammy system in the world where anybody can take an HTTP API and inject things into any service anywhere. So we want to avoid that being a problem. If I had time, I'd tell you all about OM, which is our end-to-end -end crypto, but I don't, so let's skip through all that. And I, yeah, more OM. We need help, everybody. We need people to try to run their own servers. We need to help them, uh, 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 people to help um, run the free switch integration and debug ice failures for us. Uh, we want some feedback on the APIs. If you're building a new messaging app, consider using Matrix, and please do follow us on Twitter and spread the word. Thank you very much. I think I have three minutes for questions. Got a question there? Is there a running microphone anywhere? Where's the question? There, there we go. go. During the WebRTC roundtable, um, there was talk about um, SIP not being a good fit, and Matrix looks like it has a iOS and Android client yep. that is accessible via REST um, and some sort of a push notification to wake up a client if it's been killed or something. Do you see that as a good fit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, our context was building SIP stuff for about 14 years before giving up on it and making Matrix instead. And we went through the whole pain of running SIP through to lots of mobile clients. And it's a nightmare for all the reasons which came up on the WebRTC panel. And Matrix, by default, uses very simple REST, HTTP, and JSON. There isn't perfect either in that it's quite high bandwidth. And we're using long polling by default. But honestly, long polling is an improvement over trying to keep long-lived um, SIP registration TCP or UDP sessions alive. So in fact, we're actually finding this very, very simple long poll thing to be fine. And if people want to use WebSockets or Captain Proto or CoAP or MQTT or one of these other um, transports, then they are welcome to. Matrix is not limited to HTTP. You can use whatever transport you like. But yeah, even HTTP is an improvement, we think, over plain old SIP for mobile use cases. Any other questions? No? Oh. So good question. So I repeat the question. It's um, how good is the latency? So it's all very well for kind of instant message style latencies. So we're but do the oh, hello. Um, how, do, how, how does it work for um, anything faster than that? And the answer is that it's not amazing real-time latency. Average is at about 200, 300 milliseconds, which is OK for messaging, but you would never want to put real-time media over this. But for a signaling layer at the moment, that's not that bad, honestly. Um, and if you use smarter transports like Quick or Cap and Proto or Co-App or whatever, then it could be much faster. Um, and the idea is that you use it to negotiate a real-time channel. So that if you want to do a VoIP call or RTP, and we've done MIDI, we've done all sorts of weird protocols negotiated by it, then that's fine. So you use a real-time protocol for the real-time bit, you use Matrix for the signaling, and it all works. Thanks very much. <laughs>